the only person that showed them. Yes. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we have Timothy Snowball, an attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation, and uh, John Cameron, a uh, prolific author of, uh, what are the names of those books? Uh, uh, Rewire. Rewire. Re Rekill. Rekill. And uh, in the spring, Aristocracy. Coming out soon. Yes. And a development yes. officer at Pacific Legal yes. Foundation. Welcome yes, to the show. And uh, Thank you, Richard. Uh, we enjoy having you here. We will uh, do this show for uh, the... Uh, uh, television audience at Sacramento uh, on uh, Channel 17, Sacramento, and for a cable audience or for uh, an internet com uh, audience at www.accesssacramento.org and uh, YouTube and then and now on Facebook. Uh, so, Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky. It's a, a First Amendment political speech case at the U.S. Supreme Court. Tell us about what that's all about, Timothy. Sure. So that's our big uh, First Amendment case. We're very happy about that. My good friend Wen Fa actually is the primary attorney on that case. Got it all the way up to the high court. So the issue in Mansky is there's a rule in Minnesota where you are prohibited from wearing political apparel to a polling place. And the political apparel, of course, is a very squishy term, and they've actually placed the authority to decide what counts as political apparel into the hands of the uh, election commissioner who's there actually in the office. So it can range anywhere from a uh, union t-shirt to an NRA t-shirt and anything in between at the absolute discretion of the person who's there. You mean they make me take off my don't tread on me t-shirt in order <laughs> to actually, not, Absolutely not. That, you know, that, that was what Key did. He was wearing, right. wasn't he wearing a don't tread on me t-shirt mm -hmm. and yeah. was uh, rejected from the polling place. That's what he was actually wearing. Yes. I was just yeah. guessing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he's wearing. Okay, so what, what's the penalty for wearing uh, politically incorrect? Uh, yeah, I guess politically incorrect. <laughs> Denied uh, access uh, from clothing. the poll. And, and a five thousand dollar fine. A five thousand really? dollar fine. fine? Mm -hmm. Is that is no, that no. Uh, a fine for speech? And especially when it comes to the First Amendment, I mean, the idea of political speech is really one of the primary reasons why we have a First Amendment. Not just general speech. General speech, of course, but. In particular, political speech. Okay, so so, uh, uh, well, how, how did it get to the Supreme Court? Did, did is, is Mansky been winning or losing on the way up? I, I think, like most of our uh, cases, as, as we move up, we've been losing a little bit, as we expect for a principled position. Well, no, I mean this is, this is <laughs> went, went through what the uh, circuit, the uh, appellate court in Minnesota. Correct. Right. And he and Mansky lost there. Correct. You're kidding. <laughs> and lost at Surpri fe federal district court as well. Surprising, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So, what's the prognosis with the Supremes? I think that we are hopefully optimistic. Um, the case, I believe, we're expecting it to be heard sometime for oral argument, um, set for April, the next term. Um, like many cases that we that we litigate, I can't imagine uh, losing this one. I'm always very shocked uh, when we lose a case like this, but um, I'm hoping for the best. And I think well, only we, we <laughs> the, our, our, our brilliant pit bull attorneys who grab the government by the throat and shake them until they spit back the Constitution have only lost one case in the Supreme, in the Supreme Court, Court since 1987. So right. we're, we're not, we, you guys, aren't, aren't used to losing. And this one's, you know, the last case was, uh, it was a tough case. The facts, uh, as uh, Jim Burling, our vice president of litigation says, and he won uh, Palazzolo against uh, Senator White, now Senator Whitehouse, says that, um, you know, good facts make a good case. And uh, the facts, although they were, they were very apparently in the favor of the Murr family in the case, uh, apparently the uh, Supreme Court didn't see them as we did. But we, well, that's we'd interesting. Be shocked. In the Murr case, the, the, uh, the state of Wisconsin, I understand, came back later and changed the law. Changed the law. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because letting, them, it was, letting them build their house or because it was so Because it was so bad. Yeah. The, 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 the finding was so bad that they, they usually, we sue to, to um, help air the wrongs of legislators. And in this case, the legislators passed a law to help air the wrongs of the court. So, so I, is, I would call that a win, actually. That's oh, an absolute win. You won uh, by getting the law, you know, the underlying yeah. battle. So we didn't, we didn't win the case, but we won the battle. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. so... It, that's that's the whole goal. Yeah, you know, the exactly. whole goal is to help the family and other families like them. And so, you know, d despite the fact that it, it looks like a loss, I think uh, the MERS and all the other uh, property owners who've been uh, wronged by this taking will think that 
the, the case stirred the legislature to do the right thing. And you probably and, should tell, you know, you, since we're talking about it, tell us a little bit about what the case was actually all about. Right. So I, I think the best way to demonstrate this is actually with two cocktail napkins. <laughs> so you all need to have three drinks and it'll make sense. So the MERS in the 60s um, bought a piece of land and, and uh, built a little uh, on the St. Croix River, uh, a little place to summer. And the whole family, picture Americana, picture 30 or 40 people. Norman Rockwell. Out, definitely Norman Rockwell, uh, out uh, partying by the river. Huck Finn, rafting down the St. Croix. Um, and who's telling the story? <laughs> Richard? So, um, uh, it, and it's, they're, they're wonderful folks. The, the, the people in the Midwest are, are, just, are just the greatest people. And they get together every summer and they barbecue and play games and they'd be out on the river and all the rest of that and they thought well you know this area is growing and and being good americans they thought well we'll buy another piece of land and and as this area grows uh, what we'll do is we'll sell that second piece of land and and turn this little summer house into a, a decent place for the for the family to hang out well what happened was um the the government decided um and it's really started with penn central that um, they were going to look at the property, even though this piece of property and this piece of property uh, were, were, uh, had different uh, plats and, and different tax IDs and they were taxed individually, uh, they decided to look at what they call the property as a whole. And since these properties were owned by the same people and they were right next to each other, they decided, no, it's no longer two pieces of property, even though they're paying tax on two, titles different on two because of the fact that for a short period of time title was held under one family, they decided this is now a single piece of property and under the current zoning regulations, it's uh, not qualifying to be split or to have part of it sold, so um, you can't do anything with it. So flat out taking in our eyes because they took the value of this piece of property, merged it with this one and, and took that value away from the it's family. It's like go play, go play volleyball. Yeah, they said play volleyball. You can do anything you want on this piece of property. You can camp. You can uh, you can uh, but, do you do but, your but, but no house building. Uh, you, but you can't sell it. Yeah, you can't sell. It, can't build a house. And you can't build anything on it. But, well, you can build something right in the middle of both of them now. But basically, that took away the value of all things. So they had two pieces of property. Paid eighty thousand dollars in taxes on this one over the years, and all of a sudden, now they have one piece of property. Spivey versus the United States. This is a case. Uh, where, uh, well, tell us a little bit about what the case is all about. This one. So there was a, uh, a couple who had had several burglaries um, in their apartment. They called the police and reported the burglaries, I think, as most citizens would do. Um, the police actually apprehended uh, the burglar. And when they apprehended the burglar, he told them, oh, uh, yeah, the people whose uh, apartment I, I robbed or broke into, they're doing credit card fraud. And you guys should go check that out. So um, a member of the Secret Service and a, I believe, I'm not sure what the other organization was, they came in, but they weren't local police officers, they were federal officers, came in and pretended to be uh, local detectives and went in and said, oh, we're here, hello, we're here to investigate the burglaries in your apartment and went in and pretended to dust for prints and said, oh, where did they, they I guess the couple had a camera system set up, where did the burglar go? Oh, went back in your back bedroom and went back there and looked around and poked around and uh, there's something called the plain view rule uh, under the Fourth Amendment where if a police officer observes something in plain view, that can be used as evidence against a, uh, against a suspect. So basically, the issue in Spivey is can the police uh, use outright deception to gain consent to enter um, someone's home? And the Eleventh Circuit said that they could. That was a legitimate uh, use of uh, police deception. And uh, the case... So the, the, the FBI can lie to you, you just can't lie to the FBI. <laughs> guess that's it, yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting case because there are contexts in which the police um, have been found to, able to use legitimate deception against someone in the context of a interrogation. The police can lie to you, they can use deception. Of course, you're always um, free to stop talking or to request counsel. We assume that people but know you know, But, but if, if under that circumstance, know people know they're talking to the police. Correct. In this case, right. they didn't realize, well, they, they knew they were talking, they thought they were talking to local police when in fact they were talking to federal agents. Yeah, and they thought that those police were there specifically to help them. And I think in the um, 11th Circuit opinion, the, um, they described the, um, uh, 
suspect in this case is, oh, she was relieved when the police arrived. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for trying to get our property back. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you around. I'll show you. I'll take you back. And all of these things, the entire purpose behind the Fourth Amendment, I think, is to prevent this kind of abuse. And so we're going to be filing um, an amicus brief. Um, the case is being petitioned to the Supreme Court. We'll be filing an amicus um, supporting that petition. Hopefully the High Court will take up the case and settle this question. So the, the argument is a Fourth Amendment case? It's a Fourth Amendment issue. For uh, PLF, um, what we, of course, are, are known for our strong defense of property rights. So the brief is going to be framed in terms of uh, the real, a lot of the research I've been doing lately and actually working on this brief has focused on um, one of the main um, reasons the Fourth Amendment was enacted in the first place was to protect the home. Um, the British had something called writs of assistance in the pre-revolution uh, era that were general warrants where they did not have to specify what they were looking for or any uh, probable cause for crime. They were simply government authorizations to um, seize or a person's home, go into a person's home and search, or to seize the individual. And one basically, carte blanche fishing. Expedition. Absolutely, and, and that's 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 what this smacks of um, for me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm hoping that the uh, court will take up the case. Is there any case law uh, on, uh, that that's even close to parallel? Well, you know, uh, attorneys can be a little a little tricky when it comes to to, to the case law. So, reading the Eleventh Circuit opinion, of course, um, it's interesting to see the way that the court rationalized this rule. Um, I, I would disagree, obviously, with the court, and uh, I'm hoping that when it gets up to the high court that they will uh, take what I consider more the principal position. But well, so the, the, the uh, informants, uh, undercover agents, all the rest of that, lie, deceit, all the rest of that. Um, and that's an acceptance and, and a given, and I personally disagree with it because uh, it's usually used to catch people in what we would consider as libertarians victimless crime. But this is, I think, horribly egregious in that not only did they lie about what they were there to do, but they, they did it under the, the badge of, of someone who's there to help right. um, recover property and, and, uh, and then you know, in the plain view thing. So did they have their credit card machines at laying out and the people I, I, could see it? So plain view... To me, is not looking in the bottom of somebody's uh, dresser underneath their sweaters and finding something. Um, I, I don't even understand how it could be plain view based upon. I don't know right. the facts that, that well, but I, I, I don't even know how it can be called plain view. I think they saw a few stacks of credit cards sitting around. Whatever it was, it's a very minimal standard in terms of justifying uh, reasonable suspicion then and probable cause. Mm -hmm. um, the issue, I think, really goes to the fact that even if someone, even if let's say that they were, you know, uh, guilty of credit card fraud or not guilty, or they were performing credit card fraud in the apartment, you cannot. The fact that someone is engaged in illegal activity does not retroactively sanitize an illegal search. You cannot perform an illegal search, uncover evidence of illegal activity, and then say, "Oh, well, look, it's okay. You know, we we, we know they, were, you know, we actually found they were doing some illegal activity. Therefore, the illegal search is justified." Yeah. That's not the way that it works. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I'm certainly I'm not curious about the, the you know the yeah. whole idea that I mean it's, it's a federal crime, crime, serious federal crime. We're seeing it, uh, you know, with the uh, Mueller investigation of, of uh, uh, Trump uh, campaign people that lying to the FBI is in itself a crime. Mm -hmm. Martha Stewart got uh, you know did jail time for that, mm -hmm. but the FBI can lie with impunity. I believe to whoever they're interrogating, right? That that would be yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, no, Mar Martha Stewart went to prison for lying to the FBI. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, there's a woman, I can't Hillary somebody. Oh Hillary, yeah, who, who, who uh, lied, lied to the FBI lied but didn't get charged. Multiple well. times to the FBI, and I guess if your name's Hillary, you never mind. <laughs> Just a little aside there. Yeah. Next case: Ricketts versus Miami Shores. So this is an interesting one. So the Ricketts uh, had been farming, had a vegetable garden um, in the front yard of their home. They had tried initially when they bought the home to um, grow a vegetable garden in their backyard. It wasn't getting sunlight. They weren't able to cultivate the vegetables, so they moved the garden into the front yard. They had the garden, um, and there's, it's tastefully done, for 17 years. 17 the, years? 17 years okay. they were growing their own uh, vegetables in the front yard. And uh, as far as the Ricketts say, that nothing but compliments from the neighbors. The uh, village of Miami Shores, where they live, um, amended their local zoning ordinance to specifically prohibit front yard vegetable gardens. You can have pink flamingos, you can have garden gnomes, you can have fruit plants, 
You can park, fruit trees. You can park. You can park your. You can park your jet skis. The only thing specifically. You can put your car up on the lot. <laughs> the only thing specific. That would that would be uh, real Linda. No, sorry, real Linda. It's just an easy shot. Yeah. You can't have a vegetable garden. Okay, now was the uh, statute written aimed at them, or was it just written because of some busybody neighbor that didn't uh, like uh, looking at uh, uh, peas and carrots? What difficult to say. I, I don't know what the uh, you know if there was a proliferation of vegetable gardens. I'm assuming no, but um, they were threatened to be fined. I think it was fifty dollars a day, might be more, but. Um, ultimately, they had tried to go to the local board and, and kind of save their garden, and ultimately were forced to dig up the garden. I think that they had said in terms of um, where it was at, in terms of cultivation of the vegetables, it had taken over a decade to get to the point where it was producing um, what they needed. So, well, so, so they, had, they had an asparagus bed. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate. Um, they had uh, lost, they lost the trial level, they lost at the Court of Appeals, and um, they are in the Florida court, so now they are well, people. Also, I mean, I understand the you know the uh, busybody government's moral argument. Uh, you know, why are they worrying about what people grow in their front yard? What's the legal argument that says a, 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 a municipality can't uh, tell uh, residents whatever the you know you, you have to have a lawn and you have to do this, that, and the other? Well, it's an interesting question. It, you actually find a split of authority, which is I think one of the things that makes the case really interesting. Um, on the pro side, um, there have been courts that have said, well, you know, uh, city stepping in, municipality stepping in, can pass zoning ordinances and can, they can regulate this kind of thing for aesthetic reasons, purely aesthetic reasons. Uh, we are concerned with the character and distinctive uh, nature. That's of only the, like a homeowners association, <laughs> more than more than uh, city law, but right. Um, from our perspective, um, there are two provisions of the Florida Constitution. One is the right to a, possess and enjoy property, property-based <coughs> argument. Um, the other basis would be, I think, I believe it's a privacy argument. Uh, there are two specific provisions in the Florida Constitution under which the Institute for Justice, who we're um, filing a brief on behalf of, um, has brought this case. And it's been going on for quite a bit of time. I was discussing it <coughs> actually with our with our CEO, Stephen Anderson, who would formerly had been at IJ. And he had said, oh, you know, that, that, case, that's, that case has been going on for a long time. So. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity that they contacted us, reached out to us, knowing our um, long history of defending property rights to step in and, and back them up on this case. So sure, that's an amicus? It's going to be an amicus okay. brief. Okay, which is a friend of the court right. for you for you, for you folks who aren't lawyers like me. I had to ask what amicus. I thought it might be friend, but they, they explained to me it's a friend of the court. It's an amicable definition, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. Well uh, spoken. <laughs> John, you might be interested in this. Uh, the uh, the Bears Ear and the Grand Staircase National Monuments have both been slashed in size by the Trump uh, uh, Interior Department. Uh, is that going to actually change the uh, you know what people can do on the barren wastelands in southern Utah that these uh, parks encompass? Well, I think it needs a little backstory and history here. The the whole idea of the National Monument was, I think, originally enacted to protect uh, Indian artifacts in the Southwest from being looted. And so when the, the law was written, it said that the, the requirement for the monument was the- This is the Antiquities Act. Antiquities okay. Was the minimum amount of area necessary to protect those artifacts. And so the, the billion or so acres, or it's not a billion, it's, it's a, Hundreds of thousands of millions of acres. One point five. I think. One point five was cut down to nine hundred thousand in one case. So slashed is a relative term, and the other one was, uh, I think, cut slightly more in half. So any um, any of the the carvings, the wall paintings, the the um, uh, former uh, Native American dwellings are all still protected. Uh, what is not protected is the huge land grab done by the federal government to take um, what was basically productive land for either grazing or, or mineral activity out of the economy and take it out of the hands of the people so it was productive and put it uh, behind a fence in essence. And so um, when President Trump um, uh, uh, slashed the size of it, Basically, the antiquities and all the dwellings and everything were still protected. It's just that the, the area that was uh, grabbed in this land grab is now 
um, the the citizens of the state are now allowed to use it productively. But it's still owned by the federal government. This is federal land, right? I do not know. I think it's still fed. But yeah, it's still owned still by fed. the federal government. Yeah. It's just yeah. a different different management, yeah. which allows um, uh, oil and gas production. If there's if if it happens mm -hmm. to be there, it allows. Mm -hmm. Uh, grazing, it allows multiple uses that yeah. would otherwise be uh, banned, otherwise it Correct. would just be uh, yeah. allowing hikers to uh, go on uh, uh, on meanders across the desert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the problem with the, the Antiquities Act and why um, Pacific Legal Foundation is really leading the charge and we have a case coming up uh, with a monument that was placed out in the middle of the ocean by Obama. Um, which is in essence taking a bunch of the ocean and the law specifically says land. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you can justify um, turning... Now, what uh, antiquities are they protecting out in the middle there, of the ocean? There are no antiquities and besides that it's basically in international waters um, mm -hmm. and how you can turn that into a, a monument. Um, but, but, but it that's does, it does prevent uh, it, it, it prevent that particular part of the ocean from being a fishery. And what, what's what's terrible about that is that that this part of the ocean was actually very well protected by fisheries regulations already. So saying that by turning it into a monument, you're going to uh, replenish fishing supplies and all the rest of that is is a specious argument. So it's basically just a land grab, as most of these things are, uh, taking uh, land out of productive use and, and holding it at arm's length so that it, it really you can accomplish nothing with it. Kaiden Johnson challenged a Minnesota's uh, ban on boys participating in high school dance. <laughs> I didn't know boys like to permit and uh, compete in high school dance, but well, evidently he's well, there. Right there may be the basis for this uh, antiquated and, uh, might I say, <laughs> slightly outdated rule there, Richard. Um, yeah, Caden Johnson has been dancing. Well, when, when, when Richard was in Minnesota, <laughs> no boys danced there. You they were, were out. No, no. I, 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 my mother made sure I went to Arthur Murray and learned how to waltz and Roomba. You all, ah. you all went on the high school dance teams? Uh, but no dance teams. I, I wasn't in uh, Minnesota. <laughs> well, yeah. Caden likes to dance. He's been dancing since he was a baby. Um, he's a sophomore. Baby dancer. Baby. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of the... Uh,